So th this, this table, there's usually a table like this at every No Time to Wait conference, and it's just like how we connect to the outside community. Um, if you look at the registration list for this year's No Time to Wait, uh, it always ends up being a little over half of the participants are remote participants. And w um, one of the volunteer roles we always have at No Time to Wait is that somebody in the, is in the room acting on behalf of the remote registrant. So when it goes to question and answer time or something, like somebody in the room is um, representing them in questions and answers and also adding any context. Um, so for instance, if somebody in the room is like speaking off microphone and in the room we can hear them because we're here, people who are watching on the live stream might not necessarily be able to. So the participant in the room is supposed to sort of advocate and report back to those folks so they can understand and participate as fully as anyone else in, in the room. <clears throat> and then, so in this workshop, I'm going to be using a lot of the software called OBS. I think it stands for Open Broadcast System or Solution. Do you remember what the S stands for, Nick? Studio. Stu okay, I think actually, right. yeah, OBS Studio, where it has the redundant uh, S at the end. Um, I, I love OBS so much. It's, it's an open source. A uh, program that is based on FFmpeg and is able to both stream out and uh, record at the same time. Yeah. And then I'm actually presenting my slides of OBS. Uh, let me go back to here. <clears throat> So I wanted to talk a bit about why we should stream. Um, and I think, I think nowadays, like especially post-pandemic, it's a lot more common for um, events to, to live stream and to include with people who can't necessarily be in the room. Uh, but when we started this in, in 2016, at the first No Time to Wait, it was a bit uncommon for conferences to live stream. Um, I've worked a lot with the Association of Moving Image Archivists, and sometimes they would bring somebody in the room to record, like on a, on a DV camera, but uh, it was only until pretty recently that they were live streaming. And I remember on the EMEA listserv, there was a discussion of some people advocating that the conference should be live streamed, um, but a lot of people were saying, no, this is an incredibly expensive process, you know, just kind of presuming that the only way to live stream is to hire a dedicated company that is going to come in and do that um, for us. So one of the reasons I want to have a workshop like this is just so that people can see that it's not, it's, it's, it's a complicated process to live stream, but it's not something that's uh, completely inaccessible to us with the sort of hardware that we have accessible through our work. <clears throat> um, I remember in, in some discussions of other conferences about live streams, there would be somebody would raise the point that, oh, if you live stream it for free, then people won't pay for registration. And uh, with no time to wait, this isn't really an issue. Like, we would like to, you know, uh, you know, reach and help more people, but we don't have this kind of conflict of like, oh, we need people to, to pay, so we set up a gate of the entrance to the room and make people pay to enter. Um, you know, so we want a very broad, um, audience that's both in the room and online, and we don't necessarily need to apply any exclusivity to that. Uh, you know, we want to make the event more accessible so more people can participate, even if they're uh, in different locations or cannot afford to travel here. And then, you know, getting back to more open source ethos, uh, what we share becomes building blocks um, or encouragement or resources for other folks. So a lot of times, like at conferences, like, you know, somebody will present a lot of information but be potentially helpful for, for somebody or inspiring, but the event will just kind of happen live and be over, and you'll have to try to carry that forward. But with live streaming, um, we always like leave a recording online. If our live streaming at no time to wait, it all goes to YouTube, and then you can watch it live or you can watch it after the fact. Um, so it just kind of puts out more information for others to build upon. And then I think like you know, adding in live streaming gives a lot of uh, benefits here, as I say, for not a whole lot of extra work. So now I have to go back into here. So from here, I'm going to get back into um, <clears throat> a bit of a history of the No Time to Wait live stream. This is a picture of um, the first No Time to Wait at the Deutsche Kinematek, uh, Peter presenting 
Oh, this is the same FFP1 timeline that I think ended up in uh, Joanna's presentation this morning. Um, this was a very sort of spontaneous decision to live stream this conference, and the results were a bit rough. Um, we had a laptop connected to a computer, and we were taking both the video and audio off, no, sorry, we had a laptop connected to a camera, and we were taking both the audio and the video off the camera. Um, whereas, like in this system, we have, like all the audio that is going to the speakers in the room is going to this mixing board, and a copy of that audio is going into the computer that's doing the live stream. So whatever we're hearing like from the microphones and out of the speakers is the same thing that the people on the live stream are hearing. Um, but for this early one, we didn't really have the equipment to, to do more, so we were just getting what the camera could hear, um, which was you know, like distant in the back of the room, much hissier. So it was, um, you know, it could be more of a struggle to participate. Um, also, there was only one shot. You would just see what the camera sees. Whereas um, with the setup we have here, the, uh, keep, sorry, do you mind turning the monitor to, to folks? Um, we could basically pick between showing the live stream a copy of the slides or a copy of what the camera sees, or we could like overlay them together. So at the first no time to wait, we didn't really have any of these options. We just had only what, what the camera was showing to us. And then no time to wait two was in, um, in Vienna at the Österreich Film Museum. So uh, here our setup got a little bit more complicated. Here's Kieran O'Leary. He has a laptop in front of him running OBS. Um, and just to the left of that laptop are two um, Black Magic video cards. Uh, they look like this. I can't get it unplugged because it's not actually used. Um, but this is a, uh, a Decklink card. These are often used with B-Record for doing like video capture, but it has an HDMI input, an HDMI output, and then can take various uh, audio inputs into it through a, a dongle like, like this. <clears throat> uh, but we would use these devices to connect the, the camera to. And then uh, Kieran has like a second laptop sort of on the far left where he can see f um, exactly the same thing that people are seeing on, on YouTube. <clears throat> and then you can see sort of in between these two laptops is the camera that's filming from the back. Lately, we tend to put the camera more towards the, the front of the room. And then no time to wait three. So in uh, No Time to Wait 3, we were at the British uh, Film Institute in, in London. Um, and there were a lot of lessons learned from this. We were just trying to repeat the same success we had in Vienna, but we had some problems. I remember one of them was, uh, like, we couldn't figure out how to get, we didn't have a long enough cable to go from the camera all the way to the station. So that same black magic card I was just holding up ends up getting pinned onto the, the podium leg. <clears throat> Because that was like the most elegant solution we could do. Um, in this room here, we have like an HDMI cable kind of like taped along the floor instead of that. Uh, another thing I learned about this was to definitely charge your laptop battery because when the laptop was connected to all these external devices, um, like this, this device takes power from the laptop in order to run. So when we had everything plugged into the laptop to do the live streaming, the battery would drain on the laptop faster than it could charge. So even though we had it plugged in, we just kept seeing the battery like slowly go down. So we would always like a couple of times it would be timed. So like when the break happened, we would unplug everything, let the computer charge back up. But then once the live stream would be back on, the computer would be like just like dwindling from its battery power as it went. <clears throat> So at, at this one, we have like a Mac Mini over there. So it's just connected, connected to a dedicated power source and not a battery. Um, and then the, this one, it was like the same thing where we had two video inputs. We had a copy of the same slides that go to the projection screen going to the live stream. And then the, the camera also going to the live stream. And we could pick between them. I think this was also an interesting no time to wait because there was like a fire alarm right in the middle of it. So everybody had to go outside. So I was like texting with the live stream to see like what was happening in the room. Um, so like the live stream was all still like watching, but nobody else could actually physically be in the room at the time. <clears throat> uh, 
and then uh, here we are. This I can't remember, Jusha, you made this graphic maybe, but <laughs> this is from the No Time to Wait in, in Budapest. Um, so here we were getting a bit more standardized about our documentation. So we have this graphic that is just pointing out all the pieces of it. Um, this one, we had um, this, this device here is an, uh, a, a second camera that would point at the audience. So when we would go to like a speaker's question, we could sort of rotate that around. Um, but I remember like one issue with that was when we cut to that, like some people were just like sitting right in front of the audience camera. So if somebody was like a asking like a long-winded question, you'd see somebody like rolling their eyes like in front of, like it was like, okay, maybe we shouldn't cut to the audience too much so that <laughs> we'd, you know, because whoever happened to be sitting there would just be like in, in the face of like the 100 people online. Um, but also here we had like a dedicated computer running OBS. Here we had three video inputs. There was like the, the main camera focused on the, the speaker, um, the audience camera, and then a copy of uh, the slides. And then no time to wait, five. Let's see what happened there. Oh yeah, this was a very uh, exceptional no time to wait. <laughs> So this is like our pandemic era, no time to wait. So here, we don't have any cameras. It's essentially just us recording a, a, a big combination of Zoom in GatherTown. Um, so if you attended this no time to wait, you would pick your, you would design your avatar, like get your clothing, get your hair. Oh, Randy, I see you here in the front. You're off the stage. But <laughs> and then, <laughs> Um, but we did the same tradition where we asked everybody to get up on the stage at the end for a picture. Um, you know, so I mean, relative to the others, this one was quite simple because it was just like a Zoom recording rather than uh, the whole thing. Let's see. Ah, I moved the background. Okay. No time to wait. Six. <clears throat> and then this this one in the Hague ended up. I realized I didn't have a good picture of the live stream setup that I could find. So this is just a picture of the back of that camera facing the stage. Um, but when I, when I was packing, um, like me and, and Jerome and other volunteers would just bring equipment and we were just thinking we were bringing the same equipment we brought in Budapest and everything would be fine. But then I realized I had upgraded my computer. So like my new Mac wouldn't work with this uh, black magic card. And so we had this kind of mismatch of like a bunch of incompatible audio and video equipment. Um, so when I got there, I started like running around to the electronic stores in The Hague and making a lot of like desperate purchases of devices that might or might not work. Most of them didn't work, a couple of them did. And then uh, I remember being at a bar the night before, no time to wait, like lamenting that I don't know how this live stream's gonna work. And then Irwin showed up. Um, and we made this like uh, very dramatic bike ride where I was like sitting on the back of Irwin's bike, bear hugging him as he was cycling as hard as he could to make it to like the last electronics store open in The Hague. And then they, they, we found out that they didn't have the piece that we needed, but they could have it at 9 a.m. And Irwin was gonna do the stage coordinating role th that morning. So instead we like covered for him while he biked to the hardware store, got the got the piece and like tried to get back. So we were kind of like building the live stream while we were doing it that year. Um, so, you know, we were just like, oh, we need to have everything <laughs> tested ahead of time, get our parts list correct. And then the next one is No Time to Wait 7, which is this year. Um, so I don't know, this, this desk is still a bit messy, but if I walk through the comp components of it, essentially we have like uh, the Mac Mini that I brought, um, this venue provided the keyboard monitor and, and the mouse that are attached to it. And then into that Mac Mini, there are, um, I shouldn't unplug them right now, but there's two dongles that basically take an HDMI input and convert it to USB. So the two HDMI inputs are just the one from the camera and then the ones from the slides. So normally when you're at a, a venue to give a presentation, there'll be an HDMI cable available on the podium that you plug your laptop into. Uh, but in this space, that HDMI cable here, coming out of my laptop, is going to an HDMI splitter, uh, which is over here. I'm trying not to move things too much so they don't break. Um, but the HDMI splitter sends one copy onto the projection screen and one into the computer. Um, so that way, like somebody, somebody's laptop is going 
in both directions, to the projection in the room and out to the live stream at the same time. Uh, we don't have an audience camera, at least at the, at the moment, uh, with this setup, but we just have those two video input sources, and then um, the audio is just coming off this audio board and going to the mic input on the, um, on the Mac Mini. <clears throat> and then the software you see up here is OBS, um, which I'm going to get into next. So the way I want to uh, run this workshop is that a bit later, um, I'll have us divide up into uh, small groups to make mini live streaming presentations. Um, you know, there's a bunch of different scenarios we can run. We can just do like little uh, photo shares or show a video or do like a fake news report. Um, but I'd like us in small groups to make uh, examples of running a live stream scenario, but with just content that we have like in our, in our group, um, using inputs that we have in our group. Um, so this is the website for the OBS uh, project. So if you, had, if you happen to have a laptop, um, if you head here, you'll see download links for Mac, Windows, and Linux platforms. Um, and then from here, I'm going to just do a little bit of a demo of how OBS works. And by the way, if I, like this part of the window at the top here is called just the preview screen where I see what would be uh, sent out to a live stream. And if I right click on that, I can say, um, I can just pick a full screen projector. And then this HDMI to USB reference is just a, referring to the HDMI plug I have in here. So if I pick that, it's basically just sending the entire preview out here. So if I want to set up um, a scene, and in, because I was like trying to be silly and give my slideshow in OBS, I set up like one scene per slide, but this is not normally how this would be run. Um, so I'll show you. So for every scene I make, and if I flip around, I just can see them here, um, I can add sources to it. So with this one, I'll add a, I'll do video capture device. And then I'll, I, it, whenever I'm adding one, it asks me to name it. So I'll say um, laptop camera in this case. And I'll say OK. And it gives me a drop down of what um, sources I have here. So I can use my FaceTime HD camera and add it in like this. So now you see me at a great angle. Um, so I can like resize and place this. And then, oh, I know what I want to do next. Just a second. Oh, I wanted uh, USB-C. <clears throat> All right, I just found like the tiniest USB-C cable I have. Add my phone as a second video input, and my phone is just like the popcorn emoji. So I can pick this, and then I can like arrange this here. <clears throat> so often, um, uh, <laughs> um, hi everybody. So with the live streaming this morning, like for Joanna's presentation. Um, there were obviously a ton of details in her slides. So a lot of what we did was we would show the um, slides kind of full screen. And let me click on this one. I'm going to say bring it to the top. So like we would set up her slides like this so it's full screen. And then we would put, um, let's see, let me go over to the laptop camera. And then we'd put a little thing in the corner like this. But then I, I noticed like Joanna would always look this way when she would look at her slides. 
So then I would put it over here. So when she'd be like, these are my slides, then it would like be facing the same orientation. All right, let me give you poem smaller. Oh, you know what I think I can do? I think I can do like phone two. Do you think I can get both cameras? So, is that the same or is it? Oh, is this the same? All right. Sorry, I was trying to get like both cameras to run at the same time, but <laughs> I'm not sure what the second one is. Yeah, I'm gonna remove the. Oh, I removed the purple in the background. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna just let that dangle right now. <clears throat> I'm still facing the same way. Oh, even though my phone's upside down, it like corrected the orientation. Okay, so. Oh, that's like your wide angle lenses. Oh, maybe. That's cool. Because there's three. Let me just get all, all three of them up here iPhone 3. I think this is the last one. Oh, this is just going to share my screen. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Bye. And then I can, there's a little like eye symbol here so I can turn them on and off if I want to. But yeah, you could, you could definitely like stream your cell phone if you wanted to, if you just want to have a live stream of you browsing in your photo app or like <laughs> responding to tweets. All right, now I just have so much, okay. So here I'm gonna set up an alternate screen. Um, Yeah, scene is like a preset view, and then I add the sources to it. So with this one, the sources are kind of a mess right now, but um, let's see. For this scene, I'm, I'm gonna mimic kind of like what I was doing for um, Joanna. So I'm gonna use the laptop camera and do that full screen. And then if we're kind of saying that my slides are the uh, phone, and I can um, put that up in the corner. You know, because sometimes I would want to show Joanna's face more prominently and then have the slides next to her in a little window. But sometimes I would, oh, I have to go over here. Sometimes I would want to show the slides prominently but put Joanna in a corner. So like, I can go over here and like duplicate the scene. So I c I'll just call this like, s put the word switch at the end. Um, and then here I can kind of like switch this. So up here I can have like a full screen camera. Oops, drag it, no. I click and drag the right thing. And then I'm gonna send this down. So, this, so now if I'm live streaming, what I can do is I can switch between the two depending on like what makes sense. So um, when you see one of us sitting over here, often we're trying to watch what's on the screen and see if it makes sense. So if, like if I'm, you know, if my head's like underneath the slides here, like it would make sense to switch to this view so it makes more sense to the audience and they can see what's happening better. <clears throat> yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we weren't live streaming this one just because it's, a strange workshop and like, yeah. Yeah, you can say we'll be back tomorrow. Unless we want to live stream from the bars tonight, we could <laughs> potentially do that if we had a volunteer for it. So a lot of times earlier today, like I was running over here, I was setting up a bunch of scenes. One of them was just full screen camera. One of them was full screen laptop. And then there were a bunch where it was like these, where one would be inset from one another. And then when we're running the, the live stream setup, we're just sort of switching between them to show off the information as clearly as, as we can. Um, and then I don't really have it in, in here. Um, can you switch to the title card one you have? I think there's like a... But it won't show you what it is. Yeah, but you can turn your monitor, you know. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, do you mind just like flipping through a couple of the scenes here? 
Yeah, so we always try to have one scene that we can go to if we can't show anything, like if we want some privacy in the room. Um, you know, because when we're doing this, like we try to turn off the mics, because like when the presentations are over, and we're having like private conversations up here, we don't necessarily want like 100 people viewing it. Um, so we'll go to a title card screen like this and, and make sure the audio is off. I don't know, what else do you have in here? Do you want to? Uh, we have title card plus, plus camera. Uh, we have all laptop, all camera. And then we have all of these with uh, mounting the camera to different corners. Uh, yeah. We, we set up the inset of the camera at different corners because we don't want to cut off important parts of the slide. Um, and we do also don't want to necessarily just be like, tell everyone, hey, don't load up your slide in the lower right corner. Uh, so we'll, we'll just put that inset certain into different places. So, question, but I, I noticed you have these, uh, these pixel layout things. Is that an extra setting that you put on yours? Oh, I don't know. I didn't turn that on. It was just like that. But. Oh, maybe it's snapping, I think, like the, because oh, when no, you. I've just never had it tell me like what the distance is, which mm. would be nice as well. We want to have like a five pixel fence off to the side. Yeah. And then I'm going to go through and review the sources a little bit. Um, so this second column, this second box right here, sources, um, th the one we're using for audio input is just the mic input. So it's an existing one. Um, so it's this it's this uh, audio mixer you see like right in the middle. So if I want to if I want to kill that, so I'm not broadcasting any audio, I could just slide that all the way down. If I had multiple audios coming in, um, I could adjust them. Like one of the use cases I was just talking to Morgan Morrill about was he was doing these live streams where they were um, for like home movie day. So one person would need to show uh, these videos, but then often the videos would have um, audio in it, but somebody else would want to talk over it. So somebody would have to mix this to like lower the audio on the video, but increase the audio of like the person who is like narrating on top of it. Um, so you can mix like that. Um, so, and then let's see, the next audio, uh, there's a Blackmagic device input. I don't have a Blackmagic device connected to my computer. Um, but essentially, if you go in here, it would list things like your Ultra Studio uh, Express or other types of Declan cards. You'd say what the resolution is, if it's like HD or SD, PAL or NTSC. And then you'd be able to send like any type of video you're sending through one of these cards in as a Blackmagic device input. Um, there's a browser. That, I haven't really used the browser too much, but let's see where you go in here. Oh, you can just add in a URL and it just like embeds it in, which I guess is cool. So it's not like I'm, um, it doesn't look like I'm really adding a usable um, website, but I can just like embed a website in here with this. This color source one, I'm using it for the purple background a little bit, so I could just pick like green, um, go into here and like select a color, like green. I know, this kind of obnoxious kind of green. I'm gonna sure. shut it off. I like the purple better. Um, let me see what other source. Oh yeah, the media source is good. It's just like you pick um, like an image or movie file. But often, like when I'm doing this, here I'll make a kind of cleaner scene right now. I find that the right way to do this sometimes is like if you, um, Let's see, like here I have this video called hamburger.mkv. So if I just drag this into the sources, it adds it in. So, um, and the way it's set up is if I go to that view, it'll just start playing it. If I want this full, full size, I can make it bigger. <clears throat> and then I can go back in here and add a video capture source. Say I want my laptop camera. All right, hang on, I'm gonna make a little video here. All right, now I'm going to go back to hamburger and click on the settings wheel, and I'm going to say I want it to loop because I don't want the hamburger video ever to stop. And now if I look, look over here, I can narrate the hamburger video, you know, if I'm doing fancy web stream. All right, so that was the media source one. Um, there's also screen capture. 
So if you say you're, well, it's just gonna make an infinity wall right now. Um, but here, I have like my browser open to this GitHub page. So like, you know, it's the same way you're like when you share your screen in, in Zoom or something, you can just like pick a different window. There's also options in here to like crop that particular selection in case you just wanna show a piece of it. And then kind of the most Oh, I forgot, the text one is worth showing off. Um, help text. So you just name the text, hit okay, and then you come into this area where you're like, um, hi everyone, oops. And you can say okay, and then you can just drag this around the same way as you can everything else. Um, so it's mostly using like that color background and the text to set up those earlier slides like these, you can see I have purple background, the text, and then the, the media source that I dragged in. And then the most fun one of all is the video capture device, um, where this is basically gonna show you your laptop camera if you have one, and if you have a phone connected to it, you can access the cameras on that or the actual screen of the camera. All right, now from here I wanna go through the preferences and just show off a couple places to mind. Um, let's see. I don't know if there's too much I use in this one. Nick, do you wanna point out any of these? Uh, I mean, so, so I use this for recording class. Yo, Nick, there's a microphone right in front of you. I just want to Sorry. introduce my spontaneous co-presenter, Nick yeah. Robinhoff. Sorry, yeah, and I present in class by yelling at class, so I'm not used <laughs> to mics. Um, so I use this for recording class lectures for the most part. Um, so the main places where I s spend my time is I'm not actually streaming, I'm using the output function here. So uh, the third one on the left there lets you set up um, what kind of um, uh, what kind of videos you want to record, you know, file format, codec, resolution, all that kind of stuff, um, which uh, I always have to spend, you know, a good night or two twiddling with, with a new computer, because what can it actually do? What's the highest quality that I can pull out of that machine? Um, it's always worth just running a bunch of small loops to figure out, okay, does this audio and video actually work well? Um, so I, I spend quite a bit of time there. Um, and then... I think that that's the most part. Like, I, for most of my use cases, it's like run with the defaults and the defaults treat me well. Yeah, I'll say there's sort of two recordings that OBS can potentially make. Um, I think we're, we're just running these all in simple mode. So OBS is doing one encoding and then it's streaming it out and recording it to a file. Um, but you could potentially be like, I want to stream out this like low resolution copy at a low bit rate and I want to record it at a high bit rate. It's a little bit more complex because you're making your computer do two encodings at once. Um, but it, it would be potentially better if you were in an environment where you had really slow upload speeds, but you wanted to record something in high quality. You could kind of balance out uh, to, to those, those conditions. Um, so like if on that computer, I think it's just set up to go to the movies folder. There's like all the recordings from today's streaming there uh, that we can edit up later. Um, if you go into the stream section, this is like where you connect OBS to a different streaming service. Um, if you do wanna connect this to your YouTube or Twitch account, like feel, feel free. Um, but like for the point of the workshop later, we'll just play it out to the, to the monitor here. Um, I remember, like, so I had this one case at, at my current job uh, when we were in that, like, week when we knew that the shutdown was gonna be inevitable in 2020. Um, I work at an archive in a television station and we were trying to figure out how can all the quality control operators still access all the video if they're not here and accessing video on, on the network um, because they needed to have this broadcast system play it out. So we had all these computers that were set up with uh, deck link cards that would take a video input in and record it to like a um, FFE1 file using vRecord. And we ended up switching a bunch of those computers out so the video input would just go through OBS to a stream. So we ended up having to test through these because we wanted to find something where we could just stream 
t video like 24 hours and um, 24 hours a day just perpetually. And I think YouTube gives you a cap. I think you can stream for like six hours and it cuts you off. Um, so we, and we also wanted it to be like relatively private because it was sort of an internal function. Um, if you go into the show all, like it has a tremendous amount of sources and I don't know, we had a while like laughing about let's have a CUNY TV only fans account. Like maybe we can make some money by like quality controlling our video. Um, but we ended up just using Twitch because like Twitch is for people doing gaming and I guess it's not uncalled for for somebody to have a more than 24 hour gaming session that like their fans are gonna watch. Um, but basically, I can show the YouTube one a little bit. Um, YouTube. So if you if you go into the YouTube, it'll just ask you to, you'll get this connect account um, button. It'll just bring you to a login screen at YouTube and it'll connect the two. The other way to do it is if you really dig down into uh, YouTube's preferences, it'll give you this thing called a stream key that you can paste in here. Um, so it's either through login or stream key. But then once you have that, when you go back into the main display, you have these two buttons at the bottom here, like start streaming and start recording. Um, there's a way in the setting to like link them together um, or to say it should always start recording if you're streaming. But basically, like I'm hitting one, and it's gonna complain because I'm not set up to live stream to my YouTube account right now. Or maybe I am, I'm scared to, scared to know the answer. Um, all right, but that's basically how you set up uh, recording and streaming. And then the one ever mode I wanted to show you guys is there's this option down here called studio mode. Uh, it's a little more advanced, but it cuts you to this um, display instead. And if he, before, when I'm not in studio mode, I just see what I'm streaming and I can flip around and show my different views to the live stream audience. But um, Sometimes I might want to do some, some prep to my scene without broadcasting it out. So in studio mode, I am broadcasting what is on the, the right. And then on the left, I'm just like preparing something. So, you know, I might come in here. I might want to be like, this isn't like enough. I need um, a heart at the end. You know, but I don't want people to see me editing it live. So once I have it done, I can basically cut and then it transitions the next part over. Or I could also do a fade if I want to be like super, super classy. Um, so like what's on the left is what I'm preparing and what's on the right is um, what I'm broadcasting out. And then, cause like one thing I was doing with um, Joanna's presentation, cause it had so many code blocks in it. Let me do this. <clears throat> is I was basically like taking her slides and doing zooms you know, so I could get really in close. Let me take off some of these other things. Take off the text. Remove that, okay. So, um, like, you know, if I'm broadcasting what's on the right and then I wanna do a zoom in, I would just make another scene zoomed in and fade it over. Um, and then, I don't know, for like, her code blocks, like I would kind of like do a scroll live. Cause often, you know how she was, I don't know, if you were at the earlier workshop, she would have a block around it and then it would go down to a lower one. So it was kind of like, just like doing this live on air basically, like moving it around to, you know, cause I wanted people to be able to see the text even though it was super small. All right, who's got questions? How's everyone doing? <laughs> hey, hey. Mm -hmm. But I was also using my computer for something else. Yeah. And I only wanted to record the audio from the Zoom window. Is that fixed now? I, I don't know if OBS does that. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to steal somebody else's presentation to answer this question because it this doesn't come up in the, the no time to wait scenario um, because we don't need to send out any application specific audio. Yeah, well, my, my friend Morgan Morrill, who's presented right here, uh, was presenting about this for the home movie day setup, and I will show you his recommendation was this app called Black Hole, which is like a Mac, oh, you know about this? Or? It's a reality filter also. Mm -hmm. 
So if I go down here, he essentially like kind of redirects things. Oh yeah, so he goes into Zoom and he sets as a speaker a black hole. And then that ends up being an input to OBS. So it's like a little kind of mixer you have specifically for your, um, your application audio. So if you want to play audio out of VLC, but then bring in audio from Zoom, like you, you would use black hole to kind of route everything together in, in, internally. <clears throat> All right, so at uh, 3 o'clock we have um, a break. We'll have some coffee and drinks outside. But I'm thinking what we'll do after the break is we'll um, divide up into small groups and uh, make our own little um, OBS broadcast. So I'd like to uh, divide us up, and then you know I'll re I can really leave it up to the creative imagination of each group, like what you actually want to um, make it about. But I'd like everyone to make like at least three scenes. Um, figure out amongst you the hardware you have on hand, like your laptops, your phones. Um, I can possibly like lend out some cameras. Um, you know, figure out like what inputs you can have to use in those scenes. Um, but you should have something that's like a title card, something that has a video input, you know, potentially like a video input with some alternate design where you're showing off like an image or a movie file, like a hamburger video. Um, and then if we have time at the end of the workshop, like if groups feel amazingly confident about their, uh, their live stream setup, we can have a little show and tell where you come up here, connect, and then you'd have to do like the right click, um, pro project to the um, screen to show off. Uh, so I was talking about this with some folks before lunch about how to divide up into groups, but I guess firstly I should figure out how many people are here. So talk to amongst yourselves while I count you. 10, 14, 16, 25. I think there's about 40 of us here. I'm trying to decide like what a good, uh, maybe it makes sense to have groups of five and then we can divide up into spaces both here in, in the hallway. Um, so I think to, to create our groups, just so we get a chance to meet new people, I'll have us go around the room counting out one through five and then cycle through that. Oh no, sorry, one through eight. So we'll end up having eight groups of five. Um, so you mind starting off of one and then we'll just snake around? Say one. one. <laughs> Maybe I explained this poorly. I'm trying to divide us up into eight groups. Okay, one. Okay. Pedro. Six. Six. Four. Seven. Four. Okay. All right. Uh, I think you're on four. Okay. <laughs> Six. Okay. Seven. All right. One. Seven, one, three. three. Okay. So we all said a number out loud. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me on this division. Uh, all right, so guys, we'll, we'll take a break. There'll be some coffee outside in the hallway in a few minutes. Uh, after a break, we'll come back here, cluster into our groups, and then we'll figure out like what equipment we have on hand. Uh, Nick and I will kind of circle to help with setups, distribute cameras, laptops, whatever other tools we might need. All right, so I'll see you back here and maybe um, at 3.15.